praise God for all of our single mothers. Amen. We praise God for all of our single mothers. And I want to kind of start off the word by giving you kind of like the background on why we even have Single Mothers Sunday and why it is specifically on this day to give you the context of what I'm about to share with you. We have Single Mothers Sunday because I happen to pastor a lot of single mothers. The majority of our congregation uh, is single mothers. And just like I shared with you all last Sunday, uh, when we had more people to join the ministry, that um, uh, I often pray that God will send more men into the house. But as I shared last Sunday that until he does, I, I promise to be a good steward and a good covering over the women who come to this ministry. I promise to give the word of God. I promise to be some sense of emotional security uh, and stability for you and spiritual security and stability for you. And so with that in mind, a few years ago, we decided to start doing Single Mother Sunday. Amen. We do it in the month of September because September is the ninth month of our calendar year, of the American calendar year. And as you know, uh, women, mothers, uh, you carry your children for approximately nine months, right. give or take some weeks. Right. And so it is symbolic. We rarely do things randomly. It's intentional. We're trying to drive something home. So we have Single Mother's Sunday, the first Sunday in September. The number nine is significant because the number nine is the number of finality. In mathematics, the number nine is the number of finality. So we have ten digits, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six, seven, eight, nine. Every number that is made after nine is a combination of zero through nine. So the number nine is a number of finality, but it is also the number of renaissance or new birth. It is the number of renaissance of new birth that ties into uh, childbearing. So I just said something. I wasn't just giving you factual information. It is my prayer that in this ninth month of the year that God will give you some closure to some things, but that God will also give you a new birth in some other areas of your life and the women's side. There are some things that just need to be final and they need to be done with so that the new things can come to light. So we're believing God for that for you. Having said all that, man, I want to go to the word of God. If you flip in the book of Corinth, uh, uh, Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, uh, I just want you to hold Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to minister from there today, but I don't want to read it yet. I want you to flip there, though, to Philippians chapter number 4. Amen. So this is my first of two messages today. I'm going to try to give you uh, the honors class version uh, this morning. Uh, I'm going to try to give you the honors version this morning so we can kind of move along uh, so I can get some rest before tonight. I always say that, but I tend not to get a short version. So y'all pray for me that I get a short version. Amen. I tend to say that and it never comes out that way. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. You can just hold Philippians chapter 4. And for the next few moments, I was in prayer about what to talk about and I want to talk, uh, I want to minister today uh, from the subject, uh, it is what it is. All right. It is what it is. Will you, will you uh, get, give me some crowd participation, look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, it is what it is. It is what it is. All right, so uh, I want to start here before I get there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get there and help us out with that. But uh, the Lord was talking to me a couple weeks ago, and I was asking God what to talk to my single mothers about and everybody else who's going to be at church. And uh, he dropped, and he started giving me some notes, and I'm at the, the traffic light, and I'm taking notes on my phone uh, at the traffic light, not while I'm driving, all right? All right. Uh, so I'm taking notes. Y'all pray for me. That's the version of the story I'm sharing with you all. So I'm taking notes as I'm in the car, as God is speaking to me about what to talk about, and, he, and he's giving me some notes, and then finally he gives me the subject, it is what it is. And I'm thinking like, well, Lord, I know what that usually means, so what are you telling me? So let's take this journey. Uh, together. I want to start here that everything that exists started with a thought. Everything that exists started with a thought. Somebody one day knew that people would be sitting in a building or in a building and instead of standing in that building for an hour to two hours that they would need something that they could sit their gluteus maximus or gluteus minimus on, whichever one God is giving you, uh, and that it would probably need some back support so that thing that was that it not now exists is called a chair. But uh, it didn't just randomly come from nowhere because everything that exists started with a 
thought. Uh, everything that exists started with a thought. So, so that same, so, so somebody else realized that if, uh, if people are going to gather and they're going to need chairs, then they're probably going to need something to cover themselves with. And so clothes were created because everything right. that exists started with a thought. I want to yeah. keep working that whole thing, thought connection. So everything that exists started with a thought. And then uh, at some point, they're going to need to be able to uh, pay for these, this chair and pay for uh, these clothes. So the thing that exists called money comes into play or currency that you're able to exchange one thing for another. Somebody thought we've got to have a system in order to have some exchange for a product because everything that exists started with the thought. So if it's that way with tangible things, it is also that way with intangible things. I'm building, I'm going somewhere, I promise you. So it is that in order for us to have the thing called peace, uh, that, that it, it has to start in our minds. It has little or nothing to do with our surroundings because people can have peaceful surroundings and have the candles going and the aromatherapy and the music going, but if your mind is tormented, you do not have peace. So the environment is important, but it's not as important as what's happening in your mind. Uh, love, love is another uh, thought that happens or a thing that happens that really is more in your mind because people can give you stuff but if that's not your love language you're not receiving the love that they're trying to show you your love language might be affection your love language might be uh, conversation and words and so if they're not if they're giving you something that's saying I love you but it's not the way that you communicate and love then it's really not being received with the intent that it was given or are you with me that's fine because everything that exists started with a thought if that is true then for tangible and intangible things, I want to take a step further there and tell you then that where there is wrong thinking, there is wrong living. Come on, class. Where there is wrong thinking, there is wrong living. So you could have, let's go back to this love thing, you could have people who are trying to show you love and concern, but because you have been burnt before as it relates to love, then you can't properly receive the love that somebody is trying to give because you think they have something up their sleeve. The only thing they really have up their sleeves on their arms, but your mind has told you love has always come with a catch for me. Oh, God. Love has always come with a catch for me, and if love has always come with a catch for you, then it's hard to just receive it freely. So where there is wrong thinking, there is wrong living. The Apostle Paul helps us out here in Philippians chapter 4. You, you're there. Philippians chapter 4. Verses 8 and 9. I believe there that if everything started with a thought and where there is wrong thinking, there is wrong living. In order to have right living, we've got to have a thought transplant. Everybody say thought transplant. we got to have a thought transplant. I know we're used to having other organ transplants, but I believe we've got to have a thought transplant. And so the Bible tells us how to have that thought transplant right there in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. The Bible says, and I I'm, I'm, I'm referencing the message translation. Summing it all up, friends, I say you do best by filling your minds and meditating on things that are true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, and not the ugly, things to be praised, not things to curse. Put into practice what you have learned from me, what you have heard and saw and realized. Do that and God, who makes everything work together, will work you into his most excellent Harmonies. I love that, that translation. He, he works things together. Consider the word in here. He works things together uh, in its most uh, excellent and to his most excellent harmonies, which gives a musical uh, context or, 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 or abstract thought. Uh, it gives a musical abstract thought. And I kind of thought of a symphony. I kind of thought of God being the master conductor. And as the master conductor, he knows when the percussion section is 
is supposed to come in in your life. And he knows about the rumbles that will come in before you ever get to him. He also knows when the woodwinds are supposed to come in and lightly play in your life to lighten up the rumbles from the percussion section. But he also knows when you all the way turned up and when to bring the brasses in. But the brasses never clash with the woodwinds and never try to outplay the percussion because he is the master conductor. He knows when to give certain things rest in your life. He knows when to speed some stuff up. He knows when to throw, throw some things down. And then, best of all, he knows when to put things on repeat. Oh, I love God. And he says, all you have to do is have a thought transplant. You don't have to regulate it. You ain't got to fix it. You don't have to fix the environment. Leave that to me. Just get your mind right. Because if you have wrong thinking, you have wrong living. He says, just get your mind right. That's all you got to do. And leave the conducting to me. Leave the performance to me. I just need you to be a willing participant and to get your mind right. Pastor yeah. Paul shares with us, he says, you know, people, you got to have a thought transplant, so you got to start filling your, your mind with stuff that's true. Start filling your mind with stuff that is noble, what's reputable, what's authentic, what is compelling, what's gracious. The part I like is you got you to gotta start believing for the best and not the worst. Amen. You got to start looking for the beautiful and not the ugly because we always point out what's wrong. You got to start looking for things that are right. That's basically what the, what the scripture is saying. You got to think of things to praise and not things to curse because once we find out things that are wrong, and if we spend our time talking about how they're wrong, they're not, even, they're not ever going to get better for us continuing to say how they're wrong. So he says, you got to have a thought transplant. Translate, gotta have a thought transplant. So let me give some contemporary context to this so I can get where I want to go. So it is what it is, is a statement that I'm sure that if I did an informal poll in the room, about 80% of the people have made that statement at some point in your life. Uh, it is what it is. And usually when people make the statement, it has a negative connotation. People usually make the statement, it is what it is, because they have found themselves in circumstances that it seems as though things cannot get any worse. They kind of throw their hands up and say, well, I can't do anything about it. It just is what it is. I can't change them. I can't change the situation. Uh, I can't make more money appear. Uh, I, I can't make him love me. I can't make her love. I can't, I can't make my kids do right. Look, I'm trying. I whip them. I take stuff away. I don't know what else you want me to do. It is what it is. I've heard this statement in a whole lot of different uh, conversations. And interestingly enough, USA Today uh, gave this, named this, the cliche of the year in 2004. 13 years later, God gave me revelation for a Sunday morning to tell you, really, it is what it is. So let's, let's dive in. Uh, if you scroll down a few verses, Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, that's really where I wanted to go. And God's going to talk to us from there, and I'm going to get out of your way. Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, we're we about to go a little bit deeper now. I'm doing pretty well in 10 minutes. So Bible says, a King James Version text, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. Yeah. Uh, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere in, and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I want to read those verses from the message translation because they read a little better and a little clearer. The Bible says, actually, I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. This is Paul talking. I really don't need anything personally right now. I've learned by now to be quite content, whatever my circumstances. Uh, I've learned, Paul said, I've just learned to say, it is what it is, but he kind of gives it a different spin. He said, I've learned to be quite content, whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little uh, as with much, uh, and with much as with little. He says, I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry. I love this. I'm going to share with you the recipe today. He said, I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty, whatever I have. 
whatever I am, I can make it through anything. Somebody say anything. anything. I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. He says, I know my conclusion is it is what it is also, but I've learned to my saying it is not I'm throwing my hands at and I'm done, but I basically learned to be content. Somebody shout content. Content. So let's talk about contentment just for a moment to give context because everything that you're in, you're not excited about what you're in. Can I, can I just talk to you? Can I, you? You're not always excited about the situations that you're in. You're not excited about the fact that you have more month than you have money. Nobody is excited about that. You're not excited about giving your whole life to somebody and that person has decided that they wanted to start another life or do them when at first y'all started off doing us, but now they want to do them. You're not excited about that because if you had told me that up front, maybe I would have made some different decisions. I get it. You're not excited about that. You're not excited about the fact that you got to take somebody to court to help you uh, to make them pay child support, whereas that night that you made the child, you couldn't get them off you, but now, come on class, it's just us talking, but now you got to force them to pay child support and to support what he contributed to bring it into the world. I can say that because I am the product of a single parent household. I, I'm very vulnerable and transparent on this particular Sunday because there are some circumstances that you will find yourself in. May I just talk about me for a moment? I don't want you to be offended, but I wasn't born on the right side of the tracks, according to society. As a matter of fact, I don't even remember tracks being by my house when I was born. So I know I wasn't born on the right side of the tracks. I was I was not that that was not my story. I, I, it was not my story that I was born into a two-parent household. As a matter of fact, to this day, my mother and my father have never lived in the same house at the same time. I'm blessed to pass while I was alive. I'm blessed to pastor both of them now, but that was not my story. But it took for me to grow up, to get to a point of contentment, to say you know what, it is what it is it's not that it's been wasted but Lord, I learned just to be satisfied and to put my mind at ease where I am because everything is still alright would my life have been different maybe so, I don't know but where I am now, I'm going to do what I can do with what I can do, that's all I can do, I'm not going to be upset, I'm not going to be bitter I, I'm not going to be a uh, man I'm not going to have my whole life on hold. I'm not going to blame somebody else for where I am. At some point, that it is what it is has to move from a state of hopelessness to just take it easy. Uh -huh. Easy like Sunday, Sunday morning. So, so, <laughs> so it is. Uh, it is. It is what it is. I, I know uh, Paul tells us, he says, I found a recipe. The first thing I got to tell you is I got to teach you about being content. <laughs> Let me give you a definition of contempt just for a moment. A contentment is a state of satisfaction. Contentment is a state of satisfaction or it's ease of mind. Now you gotta you gotta catch this because uh, it is what it is, and the negative connotation means it's a state of hopelessness. You throw your hands up and you're frustrated and you can't do anything else about it anyway. So you figure that if you shout loud enough and you stop loudly enough and you get frustrated loudly enough and you get all those words out your system that you want to get out, that you'll feel better. You might feel better, but it doesn't make the situation better. That's right. Amen. So when you're done crying, you still got to, as I preached last year, Single Mother Sunday, you got to deal with it. Uh -huh. so, so the Apostle Paul says, I got to teach you about contentment, and I want you to know it's a state of satisfaction, or it means to have an ease of mind, or a definition that God gave me, it is to, uh, to be simply and strategically satisfied. All right. Or contentment. I'm going to work that one in a moment. It means to be simply and strategically Satisfied. Catch this. Where there is no contentment, there are usually several things. One, there is contention. Everybody say contention. Contention. Where there's no contentment, there is usually contention. So what is contention? People are always arguing and quarreling. Okay. Let's 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 walk lightly through here, Nelson, because there are more of them than there are of you. So 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 where there's no contentment, where there is no satisfaction, where there is no ease of mind. You're all over the place, and when you're all over the place, uh, we gonna catch it. 
<laughs> Whoever is in the way is going to care. You, you never care about certain things, but now that other stuff is magnified, whoever is in the line of fire is just going to catch it. I didn't mean to say that, but, but you just happened to be there, and I was already on the edge, and the next person, your child comes to ask you, can I get some cookies? And they get a speech and some words in between, and then you tell them, I'm sorry, just go ahead and get the cookies, because if one the child asking for the cookies, you are already on edge because there was some sort of contention. There were quarreling, there, there were arguments, and because you didn't have anybody else to argue with, you're really arguing with yourself, and their requests happen to butt into your conversation. So before you and yourself were able to come, I'm going to help you with that. Before you and yourself were able to come into agreement, your child butted into They just wanted a cookie. <laughs> Because you're not mad at the child. You're not mad at the child. You're mad. You might be mad if you'd really tell the truth in that moment about what the child represents. Because when you see your child, although you would never say this to your child, but your children are blessings to you. But they catch you in, a, in the moment that you never say this aloud. Maybe it's not you, it's your friends who would say, yeah, you bring me great joy. But not only do I see great joy when I see you, I see great pain. My God. Can we talk about this for a second? I know. Oh, I, I just want you to think about it because I know that people are sitting there looking at me like, oh, I never thought that. It may not be you. Maybe God's having me minister this to you so you can minister to your friends because there are some things that you tell the truth, whether it's your children or not, that on one side it brings you great joy, but it also brings you great frustration. And may, may I just bring, let me put it on the level for everybody. If you're trying to achieve something that seems out of reach, but you can see it, in one instance it brings you great joy, but it also brings you great pain because you think, I'm so close, but I'm still not close enough. I've been going at this for years, but I'm still, it seems as though I'm going nowhere. And so you're arguing with yourself because you haven't told yourself, hey, at least I'm not there. I may not be there, but I sure ain't there. And when you have contentment, you appreciate here. Y'all aren't hearing me. Let me, let, me, let me help you. Let me help you. Inside of the word there is the word here. And you, you can't focus on appreciating here because you're used to looking at there. And, and you're torn and you're being pulled. You're being pulled back to where you came from and you're being pulled to where you're going. And it doesn't seem like you're making any progress. And there's an argument that's going. Notice how I said nothing about you and somebody else. I ain't got to that part yet. Amen. Amen. I'm on our internal conflicts. Stuff that you smile. You smile to everybody else, but you got some conversations going on in your head. Like about seven of them are talking at the same time, and you can't hear any of them. Uh, you hear all of them, but you really can't hear any one of those voices. And I'm not trying to imply that you're crazy. I'm trying to imply that you're human uh, because every one of your emotions has its own voice. And depending on the day and the circumstance will determine That's which good. ones are talking to you. That's not crazy. You got to deal with it. You got to have a thought transplant for that. So you got to say, hold on. That ain't reputable. That ain't true. That's not authentic. That's not compelling. So you got to swap these thoughts out. You got to replace these thoughts. Come on, Paul. You got to have a thought transplant. No, I refuse to see the worst. I don't see the best. I know I'm in a bad situation, but I don't see the good. I gotta intentionally have a thought transplant. I know that the situation looks ugly. The person might even look ugly, but I'm gonna see some beauty in you some way, so I gotta have a thought transplant. Yeah, yeah. So where there's no contentment, there was contention. Contention is arguing or quarreling. And think about think about this. Uh, contention sometimes plays out in the fact now I start blaming others for a decision that I made. Let's go a little bit deeper on that. So, so it's kind of like when parents make statements, I hear it all the time, it, it, it makes me cringe. Uh, we do okay at Faith Central Church, but in my other job, my day job, I hear it all the time uh, about uh, you, you, you're acting just like your dad. I'm, I'm sorry that, that you're upset because uh, let's go King James Version, because you knew uh, your child's father. You knew. Mm -hmm. Go read it in the Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you had relations with him. Okay. And I get it. And the relationship is over, but this is the result of the relationship. 
Uh, I get it. I get it. Uh, however, uh, you you can't uh, you can't be surprised. I I've sat in court uh, as as a school administrator many days. I've sat in court and, and I've heard parents say stuff like, "Oh my God, I don't know how my child got here because I raised them right and I raised them right and blah blah blah." And I'm sitting there thinking, just since the time I've known you alone, you stupid, you this. I had a parent who we were having a meeting and he called his child an N word like at least ten times during the conversation. I just had to stop and say, look, dude, you got to stop calling your child that because you can't be surprised when he lives into that. And then you talk about, oh, my God, what have I done? Because for all this time, you've been telling you've been planting seeds, angry, bitter seeds, and seeds only know how to do one thing. They grow and out of frustration. You've been, I didn't really mean it, baby. The ground doesn't know that. The ground just knows that a seed has been planted. And unless you uproot that seed and replace it with something else, it's going to keep growing. Unbeknownst to you, and then you get in a situation from I don't know what happened, Judge, for 18 years. You've been saying, He's nothing like his daddy. You're just like your daddy. You're just like your mama. You're just like your uncle. And they're living into that because you're angry. And so when you're angry, you either explode on everybody else or you implode, and both are damaging. There is good news coming in the message. I just had to get you to fix stuff first. So where there is no contentment, there is contention. Where there is no contentment, there is comparison. Everybody say comparison. Comparison. So now I find myself comparing myself to others. Uh, all right. It's Single Mother Sunday. So I'm going to be right here in this context. Because you know just as well as I know that the next one all of a sudden is the most wonderful thing. That's the sliced bread. And she is great. Uh huh. The next one. It wasn't you, but the next one. Oh, she's wonderful. We posted pictures on social media. We going on vacations. This is just that. And you sit there thinking, I got a better shape. I got the same outfit. We went to the same place. So if, if you really tell the truth with yourself, why wasn't I enough? Okay, so, so I, I want to broaden the context because I don't want you to just think I'm talking about I'm, I'm male bashing. No, comparison basically says in anything, what I have, where I am, or who I am is not enough. Yeah, this is good stuff, right? This is castor oil right here. Because I compare myself to others about a job. Why they get in the head? And I'm doing everything I know to do, Jesus. I'm doing what I know to do. And they're not doing halfway. They're not serving you at all. And they say, uh, okay, I, I've been there that the Lord had to check me on comparison and probably has to do it regularly because what I'm really telling God is, Lord, thank you for what you've given me, but no thanks because it's not enough. That's what you're really saying to God when you don't think you have enough money. And, and, and I get it. We can all use more of something, but when you're not grateful and content with what you have, you're not simply and strategically satisfied. I'm going to make that sense of that in a moment. When you're, when you're not grateful for what you have, what you're basically saying is, Lord, I Thank you for what you've given me, but no thanks because it ain't enough anyway. Okay. Mm. So where there's no contentment, there's contention. Right. Where there's no contentment, there's comparison. Where there's no contentment, there is competition. Everybody say competition. 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 So catch this. You're not on the bottom end that you want something that other people have. You're on the top end that you have stuff that other people don't have. That's a whole different dynamic. Because when you're on the, on the top end of that, that you have what other people don't have, don't let somebody who doesn't have what you have get what you have. Because now you go out, you got to go out and get more just so you can make sure that you have more than that. Wrong motives, wrong, wrong motives, because where there is wrong thinking, there is wrong living. So you always got to be a step above and two steps ahead, all that kind of stuff, because there is no contentment with what you do have. So I don't want you to just think it's comparison. Sometimes it's competition. Where there is no contentment, there is contention. Where there is no contentment, there is a comparison. Where there is no contentment, there is competition. Where there is no contentment, there is complaining. There is complaining. This is the last one. There is complaining. So uh, I, I share this probably every year around this time. Uh, I am so grateful for my mother because <coughs> I never once heard my mother uh, bash my father. 
never once heard her. But I've heard a whole lot of single mothers uh, in rage uh, bash the father. I've never, she may have done it in the shower, she may have done it in her prayer closet, she may have done it in the car. Right. She may not have done it at all, but she never did it around me. She never did it around me. And uh, uh, I, I didn't get permission for this from her, but uh, I tell the story every year, so she can uh, get me out of church, she's still mine. Uh, but one of the things that I'm so passionate about, about this particular Sunday, is that I did not get to, can I tell that story? I don't know what you're okay. going to say, so go Thank ahead. You. <laughs> I'm not here now. I <clears throat> but I tell the story every year because it's a part of, I'm not trying to hide it. It's a part of uh, my reality. So, so, so while people uh, consider abortion to be an option, I know it's going to get a little tight and nervous in here. Uh, I'm not advocating one or the other because uh, I don't know people's circumstances. I can only talk about mine. Uh, and I'm going to throw mine out here and put some word with it and let y'all go home and do what you want to do. So um, um, for, for me, I found out around uh, 15, 16, something like that, uh, that my mom was married. Uh, my, excuse me, my father was married uh, when he got with my mom to have me. And so imagine uh, the frustration that is in my mind. Uh, I'm mad at my mama, who I love to pieces. I'm mad at my father because you manipulated her, you deceived her. I'm mad at my mama because you're supposed to be saved, the Holy Ghost, be blood baptized. I'm mad. I'm mad. This is me. Y'all pray for me. I got the mic today. I'm mad. And so uh, I remember, though, I didn't say much. I was mad, but I was still respectful. Uh, Tina got a backhand, for real, though. So I, I was mad, but I was, I, was, uh, I, was, I was respectful. And I remember the Lord, I was on my way. My mom was taking me to get some money for my father so I could go on a church convention. And so I don't know how it even came up in conversation, but it came up. Oh, and I was heated. And I almost wanted to leave the money. I wasn't crazy, though. I was mad, but I wasn't crazy. So I was, I was still going to the convention. I was mad, but I wasn't crazy. So, so uh, I, I'm mad. But I remember the Lord talking to me, even as a young man, and, and he, he started helping me. And he helped me with my mom first before he helped me with my dad. He said, hold on. You got to understand uh, several things about your mom during this time. One, she was not in the church uh, two, she wasn't living for me. Three, she didn't have all of that information up front. And even if she did, since that time, she's been washed in the blood of the Lamb and forgiven. So, so he, I mean, he went to check me hard, like, who are you, 16-year-old? You ain't down nobody's cross for anybody's sin. I mean, I remember this very vividly. He started walking me through all of this bitterness that I did not even know was there because I did not know the circumstances. And isn't it amazing that when you find out something, how it's so easy to start complaining and start talking about, well, if it were me, I would I've never got myself into this situation. It's for all of us who sit on the outside of the story, having no idea of what's going on on the inside of the story, and we're finger pointing. I'm using my story, but you can apply it to yourself and other areas in your life where you're finger pointing. And if it were me, I would have done this, and I wouldn't have done that, and I would have never got myself into that situation. You have no idea what situations you will find yourselves in, given the right situation, given the what the thing that you do like. I ain't talking about the stuff you don't like is easy to resist. I'm talking about the stuff you do like. Go ahead. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord talked to me about healing my heart. And it's funny about forgiving my mind, which is funny to me as I've gotten older because she ain't owe me forgiveness. Right. No, yeah. really, for real. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the thing that really kind of checked me. I'm like, Lord's like, you asking her for forgiveness. I'm sorry. What did she do to you? That's right. Amen. She had you. She provided for you. She's raised you. She's covered you. I remember being homeless. The Lord made sure we were homeless legally by not having a permanent address. Still never slept outside under the elements. Maybe in a car once. I can't remember. But we always were provided. What are you upset about? She did what it was that she was supposed to. What are you upset? What have you done for her? That's right. This is my conversation with the Lord. And he's checking me. Uh -huh. That was an easier one than my father. <laughs> so, Lord, he, he had to work on me for a while with him. So it took about two years for me. Uh, it took more than two years. It took about six years or so for me to, uh, for God to bring me to myself. And I remember right before 
I uh, graduated from Morehouse College. I was in my dorm room one Friday night. I remember it clearly because I, I had a car and I had some money and it was nice weather and I'm in my dorm room on a Friday night. Y'all pray for me. Uh, so I'm there and the Lord's talking to me and I'm about to graduate and, uh, and I started talking to the Lord about things that I want to do when I, when I cross the stage and uh, he told me we got to deal with some family matters first. I'm trying to help some people who are trying to go to the next dimension, but there's some things you haven't dealt with that you can't speak in tongues over, you can't dance over, you can't give over, you got to deal with. Come on. Okay, I knew, it's okay. I wanted it to be this kind of type of message today. I'll inspire you tonight. So I had to deal with this stuff. And so um, I'm like, okay, Lord, well, how do I do it? I'm cool with doing it. I'm not going back and forth with God, you know, because he had already gotten me together with my mom, so my thinking has changed now. I'm like, how do I do it? I graduated from school. I came home. I told my dad, I said, hey, man, I need to meet with you. Let's go to lunch. He said, like, okay. So we went to lunch, and uh, we were downtown Detroit, and we're sitting there, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm doing a whole little small talk. Hey, how you doing? How you man? Blah, 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 blah. Great. Blah, blah, blah. I said, this is why I brought you to lunch. And so we start talking, and from the conversation, this is what the Lord had told me up front. So I knew what to say when I got to the lunch. What he told me was, is that you can't go back, but you can go on. Do you know how liberating that was for me? That no matter what years have passed, uh, that that is a good moment and a good word for you. No matter where you are, whether it's with a significant other, a parent, a friend, a job, what have you, somebody who killed your dog, your hamster, whatever, that you can't go back, but you can go on. So the question then becomes, where do we go from here, and how do we get here, and what does that look like? Amen. Uh -huh. We have that conversation and it totally de-armed him because he shared with me, I didn't know what you were going to say. And I was a little nervous because all your life, I never knew what you thought about. Me. Wow. This is this man-to-man -man conversation we're having. I don't know why I'm going here. This is not in my notes, but I'm going to sum it up in a second. So we're having this conversation. And I said, Dad, you know, I appreciate you. I, I, I love you. I really, really do. Uh, because my father, although he was absent physically, he was not absent financially. And there is a difference. And I'm not trying to tell you that money can, set, can, can uh, replace time or relationship. I'm not. But there is a difference when somebody is absent altogether versus them just being absent physically or just being absent financially. There is a difference. Because you can be there physically and be an extra mouth to feed you. Uh, I'm, I'm done with that part. Okay. Or, or you could be there absent physically and be there financially. So I appreciate it. I told him, I thank you for giving. I thank you for not abandoning your responsibilities. It's not like I had gone all that time without seeing him. I saw him a few times a year. But I, will also, I also had to know for him, though, sir, you hadn't heard me preach until I had already been preaching for 13 years. The first sermon you heard of me, I'd already been doing this for 13 years. I'm not upset about it, but I remembered it. Mm -hmm. You never made it to a basketball game or a baseball game. The one who allowed me to miss church, which was the only time she allowed me to miss church, was that lady right there who made sure I made it to basketball games and baseball games because she tried to keep me and my sister having a normal life as possible. I'm sure I benefited more than Nicole. However, uh, it is what it is. We, we've gotten over there since that time. However, uh, you know, it is, it is what it is. It is. Uh, what it is. So, so, so uh, we're, we're there and uh, we're having this conversation and, and I was sharing those things with him uh, 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 and, and he just wanted to tell me, he started crying, started crying and he told me, he said, out of all my children, you're the one who I'm actually proudest of and I have some, I have some amazing siblings, like one worked for the military, one worked for the government and the CIA, I have some amazing siblings. So, but he said, he said, you're the one, though, who is always grateful. 
You're the one who always says thanks for what I do. So for them, they expect it. They just assume you're supposed to do it. And I can tell them I don't have much and I only have $50. And they're like, well, may I have 45 of them? They just want to take and take and take. Whereas you, you will ask me if I need anything. And, I, and I, I'm just sitting there and I'm listening to the conversation because what the Lord had already shared with me was is that you cannot go back. But you can go on. I'm sharing this to tell you that you have to get to a place of some sort of contentment that no, everything is not all right. But I ain't going to stay on the fact that everything is not all right. Some of this stuff we can eventually make way. Apostle Paul tells us then, let me, let, let me move on. Apostle Paul tells us then that you got to get some contentment. Everybody say contentment. contentment. I, I, didn't, I didn't lose where I was going. I, you got to get some contentment. And so here is the thing. If you don't get some contentment, uh, you, I, want, I want you to think about it this way. That all of us in this room, we have problems. All of us have some sort. You have problems, okay? I have problems. It doesn't make a difference what they are. I'm not going to categorize your uh, problems, uh, but we all have problems. But please understand this. Some people would love to have your problems. Amen. Huh? We in the closet talking about I'm late to work because I couldn't figure out what I was going to wear. No, for real. Come on. Come on, come on. I was going to wear one thing last night, but after my rough night's sleep, I wasn't in the mood to wear that color. So what am I going to So we're sitting there, or we're running in between two and three closets. Come on, I don't know what I'm going to wear. And then we'll come to the conclusion, I don't have nothing to wear. <laughs> no, for real. Because some people would love to have that problem. Amen. Uh, Amen. Oh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help because I swear this message and bring it to a close. So, so, so we're talking about having a bad hair day because the hair that God gave me won't lay right. The hair that I put in won't lay right. The hair that came off won't lay right. But the cancer patient would love to have a bad hair day because somebody would love to have your problem. Amen. That's right. It, it, it'll help you. To, to, to change, it'll help in your thought transplant that. Yeah, what, what your concerns are, your problems are, they are valid, but, but somebody would love to have your problems. So, with that in mind, you can always be thoughtful and thankful. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You can always, yeah. always be thoughtful and thankful. I was taught some time ago that if you can think, you can thank. Yeah. All right, so let, let me say it again that if you can think, you can thank. The old school church used to say, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, all he's done for me. Let's think about, I was talking to my barber about this the other day, and I said to Jim, he said, Nelson, I don't understand how people uh, don't believe in God. I said, I don't get it either, man, because if we just thought about the stupid stuff that we've done that God has kept us from. Forget about the other stuff. Forget about the car. Forget about the house, the wife, the husband, the children, the deposit stuff. If we can just think about the stupid stuff that we knew was stupid when we were doing it, and God still let us stay alive, and we're here to talk about, that all by itself. Gotta tell you, there's something bigger than me, greater than me. Because my friend offered to be the designated driver, and I still kept the bottle up. Come on, Pastor. Mm, mm. So, so it is. You gotta always be thoughtful and thankful. I gotta end the message. So, I gotta end the message. The, uh, the definition that I gave you for contentment, I thank you. I didn't mean to go this long. The story about my dad kind of got us there. The definition I gave you about contentment was a state of satisfaction, ease of mind, or to be simply and strategically uh, satisfied. Simply and strategically satisfied. Simply and strategically satisfied. So, this is what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I, got, I found a recipe for you. Uh, he said, I've learned by now, he said, I've learned in my life by now uh, to be quite content, uh, to be simply and strategically satisfied uh, in whatever my circumstances are. I'm just as happy with a little as I am with much because I recognize it is what it is. Uh, he said, I've learned how to be happy with much as it is with little. He said, I found a recipe that whether I am full or whether I'm hungry, whether my hands are full or whether they're empty, catch this, whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it 
through anything in the one who makes me who I am. Let, let me give you three simple preaching points. If you're gonna if you're gonna change your understanding about it is what it is and be simply and strategically satisfied, this is how you gotta do it. Class number one is that you gotta make the most of where you are. You gotta make the most of where you are. The apostle Paul said, I didn't really see myself being here. I didn't want to be writing this letter to you from prison, because that's where he was writing it from. I didn't want to be, I didn't do anything to get in prison. The reason why he got there, he did not break any laws. He got to prison because he represented the Lord. That's a whole other message for another day. He wasn't a fugitive. He didn't commit a misdemeanor. He did not commit a felony. He got there not because it was his fault, but because it was his faith. May I submit to you that there are some places that you will find yourself, not because it's your fault, but your faith has taken you, the stance that you have for something has taken you to a particular place that is not comfortable, that is not conventional, that is not convenient, but if you are going to say it is what it is with God backing you up, you got to make the most of where you are. Next thing is that you got to make the most of what you have. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. This ain't the first time you've been in a crunch. Mm -hmm. This ain't the first time you had to make something out of nothing. Mm -hmm. Single mothers, you're good at that because they'll eat if you don't eat. Right. It's interesting. I had a professional development the other day with my staff, and it's interesting because it came up. That, that students who we were talking about this in our mm -hmm. mental health professional development, that, that students uh, who have uh, concerns, students are usually more concerned about their parents not eating uh, than they are about not eating when it comes to hunger uh, and, and, and children's hunger. If they're more concerned when they were interviewed, they were more concerned not because of the type of food they had to eat, which wasn't what they wanted, but they were more concerned that their mother didn't have anything to eat while they're sitting there eating and they're trying to offer it to her while she's offering it back to them. No, baby, you just go ahead and eat because this ain't the first time we had to make the most of what we had. This is not the, this is not the first time that we've had to sacrifice. Come on, single mothers and those who love them. This ain't the first time that you, that you wanted more, but you didn't have. This ain't the first time that you had to tell yourself uh, a little is better than having nothing. I'd rather have a little more, but a little is better than having nothing. This is not the first time we've been here. It's not the first time you had to tell yourself, I may not have everything, but I do have something. This is not the first time. And so the Apostle Paul encourages us to make the most of what you have. Glory to God. Glory to God. Okay, crowd participation. Look at somebody and tell them you look good sitting next to me. Uh, no, don't really tell them you look good sitting next to me. And, and that's a compliment because the fact that you can smile, you can laugh, the fact that you can even say that says that the thing you thought was going to kill you didn't kill you. You look good sitting here in the house of God. Head messed up or head down, you look good sitting here. Misfit or name brand, you look good sitting here because you learn to make the most of what you have. Amen. Amen. You gotta make the most of where you are. You gotta make the most of what you have. My last one. Remember, contentment means to be simply and strategically satisfied. Pastor, why do you say strategically? I say strategically because you recognize that your status is subject to change. Amen. Glory, 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 let me, glory, let me glory, close the Bible. I got one more make the most of. <laughs> Your status is about to change. Because you only need strategy if you're about to bust a move. Uh -huh. <laughs> which, 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 which tells yourself, hey, I'm going to make the most of where I am. Uh, but where I am ain't where I'm going to stay. Can I, can I close it down? I'm going to make the most of what I have. But what I have ain't all I'm ever going to have. So, so I'm simply satisfied, but I'm strategically satisfied because I'm about to bust the move. And this is why I'm about to bust the move. is because I'm going to make the most of who I am. 
Uh -huh. That's the last one. I'm going to make the most of who I am and, and, and who are you really. I'm so glad that you asked. Apostle Paul tells us in verse number 13, he says, whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything. Somebody say anything. In the one who makes me who I am. King James Version says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. When I walk into this, I walk in weak because I'm thinking it is what it is. But once I had a thought transplant, once I found out where I am and what I have and who I am, I got strengthened all of a sudden because I understood that I'm not taking this walk by myself. Maybe daddy walked off, but I'm not taking this walk by myself. Husband died, but I'm not making this walk by myself. My family didn't understand, but I'm not making this walk by myself. They told me to leave him alone, but I'm not making this walk by myself. It's a burden to everybody else to watch the children, but I'm not making this walk by myself. Yes. Because I recognize who I am. And I only am who I am because of who's in me. You don't hear what I'm telling you? Because of who's in me. Amen. So I'm content for what I have. Mm -hmm. I'm content where I am. Mm -hmm. I'm content with who I am. But I understand that my status is about to change. Amen. Oh, yeah. Yes. So when God moves me somewhere else, I'm going to make the most of where I am. Amen. When He gives me more, I'm going to make the most of what I have. Amen. When he shows more of me to me through him, I'm going to make the most of who I am. And wherever I go, when I throw up my hands the next time and say, it is what it is, it's going to have a different meaning to me. Amen. Everybody stand up. It has not always 